Okay, so Caroline, Caroline has started the uh, the recording. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to <laughs> welcome to 2022. So I hope everyone had a good. Uh, excuse me. Okay. I assume, I assume that I assume that everyone can hear me now. Um, okay, so I hope everyone had a, I hope everyone had a good uh, a good holiday period, um, and I hope that um, the last few sessions that we have together will be um, uh, interesting for you. Um, I think. Uh, it's certainly been quite a <laughs> certainly been quite a long um, quite a long journey, but I hope. But hopefully, uh, along the way, it has given you something uh, some things to think about. Okay, so um, I'm going to I'm going to start now. Today, for some reason, the uh, sorry, just one second. For some reason, the connection well it's the usual thing the connection is not fantastic i think so um i'm sharing i'm sharing my screen can you see my screen just someone put on the chat yes or no can you see the the let's say the the powerpoint of the slide yes okay good stuff so um let's take it from here Mm. Okay. Um, before we start, register the register. The link is back. Is going in the um, is going in the chat again. So the link is on the chat for the register. So you should be okay. Right. So um, let's make a start. So what uh, what I'm going to what I'm going to talk about um, today is. Um, another let's say another extremely important topic always all of this top all of these topics are in some way connected with the environment and um, perhaps uh, one of the uh, one of the things which is as we will see from the the, the numbers the data uh, that I'm going to show you um, there are certain uh, aspects of the um, the food the food production system or the food system in general let's say um, which have a an extremely important impact on um, on uh, obviously on our lives um, but also on the um, let's say the 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 discourse about uh, climate change and uh, what we can possibly do about it. Okay. So, um, okay. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to look. I'm going to look at this, uh, the food production system. Now, um, on the on the slide, this is the sort of the calendar that we've sort of followed. Um, I've inverted these two because I was, going to, I was going to talk about conservation and invasive species but um, since the invasive species is actually sort of linked to the let's say the food production system and the food production part is a little bit let's say bigger um, I'm going to swap these over and um, next time on the, the 24th I will um, pick up the pieces that we haven't really covered and then in the last session which is at the beginning of February um, I'm going to sort of do a, a bit of a, uh, a bit of a summary over the whole thing so um, hopefully uh, this will be uh, uh, this will be uh, interesting for you so um, we're almost uh, almost at the end of our let's say our journey Okay, so um, food. Well, food is obviously very important because it provides us with the energy that we need to uh, to live. Um, it's also uh, very important culturally. I think right way, 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 way back at the beginning, um, I think I uh, I sort of mentioned something about uh, culture, and of course, food is a 
is a very important, um, let's say, uh, representation of culture. Everyone, every country, every nation, every group of people has their uh, has their own uh, particular um, national dish or or a dish associated with their uh, with their ethnic background, and people can get very, let's say. Um, uh, very fiercely proud about this um, but of course the other aspect is that over the particularly over the last 20 or 30 years um, the amount of food and the types of food available have um, really sort of uh, become well um, quite <laughs> there's a lot more stuff available now than there ever was um, and Part of this is, uh, let's say, it's a it's a representation of the idea of globalisation. So, uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not making any any judgments there. Just it's a fact of life that over the last 20 or 30 years, things have changed. So, um, hopefully, you can see this okay. But um, we're looking at the situation now and we're looking at the situation going into the future into the near future because um, there are some let's say uh, it's clear that the, popu the, the, the population of the world is, um, is, is growing um, although it seems to be growing a little bit less quickly than it was uh, a little while ago so um, we're going to be reaching a point where there are uh, there are uh, nine or ten billion people on the planet um, but what I'd like to start with is I'd like to start with the um, the situation um, which is shown on this graph here because I thought this was a was quite an interesting graph because it uh, it it's a good summary of, uh, of where things are going um, so this is 2030, 2025, 2020. So we're, we're, we're sort of around about here. This is historical data. This is projected into the future. Um, this is, is so the, the, let's say the, the need for food is projected, the demand for food is projected to increase. Um, as you can possibly imagine with an increase in population but the background should we should always bear in mind and we will see this at some points uh, in the uh, in in this set of uh, in this set of slides that um, there is more than enough food produced around the world there's more than enough food for everybody it's just that uh, it's badly distributed uh, in the sense that um, a lot of food is produced, uh, whether that's grown and then processed, or <coughs> whether it's um, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's grown uh, simply. A lot of food is produced in um, in areas where um, there's plenty. There's, al there's already plenty. Um, these are areas which are, uh, let's say, ge um, uh, geographically blessed with um, uh, good climate, good soil, uh, and economically blessed with um, good access to resources. Um, and so what the problem really is around the, let's say, the... Um, uh, feeding everybody is more to do with the distribution rather than the actual um, the actual food itself. However, uh, as we will see, the, there are some other aspects about um, what it is that people what it is that people eat, which um, have other influences, <coughs> have other effects on. Uh, on the or have effects on the environment so looking at the demand <coughs> we, can, we can see that um, in general it's uh, the demand is set to increase but if we look at the proportion of where this demand is set to increase you can see that there are some places which are relatively steady so Japan seems to be relatively steady um, the European Union if anything is projected to contract somewhat um, the United States is, is a very very 
slow contraction. Um, but as we know, uh, there's a certain, let's say, um, uh, there's a certain excess of uh, food in the US anyway. So, um, but then we have India and China, which are set to um, to to expand along with other countries in Asia. So, okay, overall, um, this is FAO um, uh, data, FAO data, which is that the, by 2030, food demand is expected to increase by a third, which is quite a lot if we think about it, okay? So, um, what, what are we going to look at today? Now, I, I, I have to apologize first of all for the, the the first couple of slides because the first one in particular is um, uh, we're going to talk about the food system and the food system is an extremely complex system in the sense that it's um, it's a set of interacting subsystems which are extreme have extremely let's say um, extremely deep interconnections between them um, but which we tend not to think about all all together and in fact the uh, if we look at the food system we will see that it's actually incredibly complex and it's across the whole planet so just looking at uh, movement of, of one example of food um, we can probably imagine that this happens because we have, uh, we may have um, wheat or we may have uh, flour from Manitoba, wherever. But you can see this is wheat, and this is how wheat is moved around the world. So it's going. You can see that there's a lot of interconnections between um, between uh, different types of uh, uh, different areas where. Um, there is a lot of uh, produce grown and which are connecting to uh, places uh, which can be quite far around the world so f for an, for example i don't think I, I don't think i have the the diagram here but um, a similar diagram for for soybean production would show that most of the soybeans actually end up in Asia and most of that en actually ends up in China because they're a big market um, but they're grown all over the world where the climate is uh, suitable so essentially what we have is we have um, uh, a very let's say a very global um, uh, a very global system here okay there it is um, I'm not going to go into this in, in any great detail here but I just wanted to show you this th this particular um, this particular diagram because it struck me when I saw it and I thought good lord that's complicated um, you could spend hours just talking around different pieces of it but there is a, a simpler version and that's I'm that's where I'm going to start here so we can think about the food system itself as being made up of um, a number of different pieces okay each piece as you can possibly imagine is a system in a subsystem in its own right um, but of course these things are connected so um, if we think about the main pieces we can think about um, we can think about the fact that well we'll start with the biophysical environment because farmers uh, farmers grow things um, or they, they either cultivate crops or they raise animals um, but there is someone somewhere who is um, someone somewhere who is growing stuff um, what does that what does that depend on well of course it will depend on um, a whole set of factors which are related to the soil um, the plants, the amount of water, the climate, how are you growing, are you growing inside, are you growing outside, um, a, a, myriad, uh, a myriad of factors which um, will affect what can grow where and how much you, how much you can grow okay and how much it will give you so that's the let's say the fields if you like um, 
coupled with that, of course, we have the fact that farmers will sell stuff, farmers grow things to sell. Uh, once upon a time, of course, people, um, everything, when, let's say, in a very local world, um, a lot of people grew stuff for themselves, uh, to eat themselves. But farmers, uh, from the moment that farming was invented, um, were farmers have always been absolutely crucial to the um, to the development of. Excuse me, can you can you put your microphone on mute, please? Please, can you put your microphones on mute? This is a bit of a inter in interference there. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so so farmers have always been. Um, really important in the fact that they, they're able to grow excess so they get the stuff that they need but there's, they're also growing for other people and that's the key thing um, it, and it's the excess which allows a society to develop and specialise and so you get uh, people who are um, most of society is not actually most of the people are not actually involved in growing food at all uh, or producing food in any way um, so what they, what's the role of these people? Well, they, these people, that's us. Uh, we're the consumers, and that means there's a market. And in particularly in in modern societies um, where there is, uh, let's say, there's a lot of exchange of goods across the world and around the world, um, the market can get uh, extremely, let's say, extremely detailed, extremely complex. And um, there can be a lot of choice, and so you get you get to the you get to the state where um, consumer choices will influence what farmers will grow, and there are s quite a, quite a number of examples of this. Um, I think over the last few years, there's been a lot of, a lot said about, for example, palm oil. Uh, palm oil is. Um, uh, it's, an, it's an oil which is used in uh, food preparation and it has very particular characteristics which allow it to be uh, to be used in this way and which um, which give um, which give particular characteristics to the food that it's used in okay uh, and so what's happened is that um, in particular in uh, in uh, tropical places where these palm uh, palm trees grow, um, there has been a lot. There's uh, been a drive to uh, for large scale deforestation to create palm palm oil plantations. Um, this is just one example. There are many others as well. So uh, and why? Because this is driven by a consumer desire for the products which contain these uh, these particular ingredients. Okay. Um, and okay, you can get into the let's say the detailed economic arguments about the, how the market is structured and competition and all sorts of stuff. But you can see that the market has a has a part plays a part in the food system. At the same time, on the other side of the the environment here, which is the the, the fields, we've got the science and technology. So. Um, now here I know that the, this is sort of qu this can be quite emotive um, but just from a very simple let's say simple perspective um, the um, the advent of nitrogen fertilizers uh, nitrogen phosphorus fertilizers uh, synthetically made rather than uh, from um, from nature um, has had a huge impact on uh, the ability of farmers to grow enough food for uh, the societies that they take part in. Um, and in particular, this is something which is associated with something we'll see in a few minutes, the, uh, the so-called green revolution. Um, now, of course, we now recognize that 
it's like a two-edged sword. Um, there's good and there's bad, and you can go you can go to excess. And in this particular type of situation, um, having more or using more is not necessarily the um, is not necessarily the best uh, the best policy, let's say. Um, but it's clear that we have uh, science and technology play a huge role in uh, the ability of the food system to produce enough food for, what is it, six and a half, seven billion people, which is a lot of people, um, most of whom are living in cities. So, um, but even at a very base level, we're talking about, we're talking about um, not just the uh, the inputs in terms of the, the fertilizers and stuff, but we're also talking about machines for collecting, machines for um, uh, transporting, machines for um, uh, working with the uh, with the produce. So uh, we're talking let's well we're talking an industrialization of the um, of the farm uh, of the farming process. Okay. Now, so this is so these are these are sort of maybe fairly uh, fairly obvious. Um, the other aspect are that um, you have uh, a whole set of uh, what we call social actors. So um, this is a bit more diffuse, and it's maybe a little bit more subtle uh, in the sense that we it's there, we know it, but we don't maybe usually give it pay it much attention. Um, but for example, uh, the um, the role that education plays in um, uh, in in providing people with not only with information but also with the uh, the ability to um, find out and think about what's happening in this uh, in this in this system. Um, the role of the media. Uh, and of course, if we think about the role of the media, for example, if you look at if you look at um, excuse me, can I ask you to switch your microphone off, please? Close your microphone, please. Excuse me, I can't say I can't see who it is who's okay. Um, okay, so if you look at the media, so for example, um, if you take a, a particularly, I'm sorry, but I don't hear anything. Uh, can can people still hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, okay. So, in general, I can. So that tells. Thank you. That tells me that uh, Vildan. I think it might be your speakers or your headphones. Okay. So you might have to check that. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you look at the particularly, let's say, the contentious issue of um, genetically modified crops, for example. Um, according to the media you read, you will get a different spin um, according to the uh, the sources that you look for. But of course, these are uh, this information is out there and it's um, it's circulating, and it does impact ultimately on uh, on political decisions. And so this is where we also have the policy part, which is. Uh, not just, let's say, uh, political uh, decisions about um, uh, investment or not investment in agriculture, but also things like the, the labour and the trade laws, um, <coughs> standards for food. Uh, now, for example, um, there are huge differences between the, uh, the, the food standards in the US and the food standards in Europe in terms of what is allowed what is not allowed, okay? Um, what your beef burger can contain and what it can't. Um, now these are uh, these are based on a particular, let's say, um, I wouldn't say ideology because that's not the right word. Uh, they're based on a particular way of approaching 
um, a problem of the unknown, which is that in Europe we tend to take the um, the cautionary principle, which is um, if we don't know exactly what's going to happen, then it's better to uh, keep it and keep it on one side until we do. Uh, the Americans have a completely different way around, which is they will go forward until they find out the thing causes a problem, which of course um, is maybe uh, not perhaps the best way of uh, of dealing th dealing with things. But okay, so the point is that we've got these three. Let's oh, sorry, we've got these five main um, main parts. But um, if we look at the uh, the thing that we may recognise more um, uh, more easily, uh, this is the supply chain. So you can imagine that uh, this is where um, the food, the, the seeds, the fertiliser, the energy from the sun and the rain um, is put into us into this process so this is a process within the system um, each one of these things in itself is uh, is, is a complex piece of uh, interactions between different uh, uh, different factors different groups different actors different inputs but this is the process that we would recognize so from the farmer through the manufacturers via the, the 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 trucks or the lorries with the the supermarket sign on um to the shop where we can buy it and onto our table so this is what we uh this is what we would recognize i think and so from a let's say from a, a production point of view um you could say that the food and the services associated with the food are going in this direction but the information about the the what needs to be grown which is the what what is technically called the demand information but it's simply um, grow more grow more of this because consumers want more of this um, and of course the money is flowing in the other direction so this is a sort of an, uh, an overview of the whole um, of the whole food system really quite a really quite a complex and fascinating absolutely fascinating um, uh, a fascinating thing which has developed over time okay so it's clear that the that this food system um, is bears very little relationship to the neo the first Neolithic farmers uh, uh, cultivating wild wheat wild wheat in the Middle East um, in the uh, <coughs> in the Akkadian uh, civilizations um, but in particular since um, since 1945 there's obviously there's been a huge increase in population and there's been a huge increase in ec economic activity and coupled with these there have been huge changes in cultural and technological um, production practices so um, all of these things have uh, have had their influence or have influenced the um, uh, global agriculture in general um, and an, an in another factor around this is that um, urbanization is a is a key is a key factor in this um, as people move to cities and they um, they get better jobs and they earn more money um, they will increase their uh, they will they will increase their dietary intake their demand for food um, but also they may change and quite often they do change the dietary preferences and historically what's happened over the last uh, last 40 50 years is that um, these changes uh, typically shift towards uh, foods which are more uh, are more resource intensive in other words um, they're more elaborate in some way whether that's because for example the uh, 
the diet in uh, in China is shifting towards a more meat-based diet, whereas once upon a time there was uh, not so much meat around, and so it was relatively uh, relatively um, meat was a relatively uh, not not a minor, but it was a, a small, a relatively small component of the diet. Um, people have, um, uh, with increased, um, well, being better off, uh, they've uh, increased economic. Um, uh, uh, fluidity, they've uh, liquidity. Sorry, not fluidity. They've um, uh, they they're able to f to afford um, more meat. They're able to afford more, uh, let's say, luxury items, which become the standard, which become the normal. Um, but of course, if we just have to think about the numbers, since we're talking about lots of people, if everyone s suddenly goes from eating uh, one pork chop a week to eating two, that's um, that's a hundred percent increase. But it's also if it's on a huge scale, that's a lot more pork which is being produced. Okay, so uh, the, the the numbers game becomes really uh, becomes really important as people uh, as whole whole societies and whole. Uh, um, Stratas, uh, strata of societies uh, um, change their um, their dietary preferences. Um, another fact, which or another point, which I think is uh, is important to under is important to underline here, um, but this is not so much to do with the food system itself as to do with where the food goes, and that is this. Um, since a lot of people are living in cities, uh, cities are complex uh, organisations as, we, as we've seen, um, but in order to function well, they need stable food supplies, otherwise, of course, um, anarchy reigns. So, um, quite often, uh, the, let's say, the, there's a, the interplay between the city, between the urban and the rural is, uh, is very important in the sense that the rural must be able to supply the urban with um, a constant supply of, uh, of nutrients. Okay, so some more numbers about the, uh, the agri-food system. Okay, so we've got... Um, if we think about where, if we think about the Earth's surface, uh, of course we can't grow everything everywhere because the Earth is not flat, it's not a flat sphere. We have mountains, we have valleys, we have uh, deserts, we have lakes, we have all sorts of stuff. So topographically it's a very, let's say, very varied, um, very varied place, a very varied landscape. Um, but about 50% of the Earth's surface where plants grow, so that's plants in general, is used for agriculture, which is a lot. Um, about 70% of the fresh water available is used by the agricultural system. Um, about 25 to 30, that's nearly a third of the greenhouse, between a quarter and a third of the greenhouse gas emissions are produced by the food system. So that's uh, if we think about the agri agricultural part of the food system. So that's the, uh, that's the growing and the uh, animal husbandry and what have you. Okay. Um, as far as uh, as far as the, another aspect of the uh, of the agri-food system is concerned, the fisheries, um, and I'm not really going to talk much about those. Um, I've tended to concentrate on agriculture here. Um, increasing populations um, has led to overfishing in many many different places. We saw an example. A few weeks ago, of the uh, of what happened in the Grand Banks, uh, which is a an environmental catastrophe in the sense that um, there's no way that that ecosystem will ever recover because those animals, those fish, have gone. Um, 
but the other main fisheries around the world are in a sim very similar position. The tragedy is that the lesson is there. It's already been seen, but um, governments uh, choose to choose to ignore this. And as we said in the uh, in the session on the the tragedy of the commons, um, part of the problem is that uh, um, it not being a single the resource of a single nation, no one has uh, a single responsibility for it. Okay. Um, so, thinking about uh, other aspects of this uh, of this uh, agri-food system, the uh, we know that um, animal products, uh, particular in particular, growing beef, uh, cattle raising, is a primary driver for um, deforestation. Um, Brazil is the classic example here. Um, and one of the consequences of all of this is that the biodiversity, um, not just now biodiversity is not just lots of um, lots of strange animals living in a jungle. Um, it, it's also much more mundane things like the sorts of birds and flowers and bees and insects and things that maybe the older ones amongst us uh, would see when we were when we were children. Um, it's it's all uh, biodiversity is obviously all over the all over the place and. Um, one of the consequences of industrial uh, food production is the or the the large scale agriculture which is needed for the um, uh, for the uh, for the production of food for the people in the cities um, is that uh, the number of species um, uh, available, let's say the number of species in the environment um, is is reduced as the farms expand, uh, or as, for example, as farmers use uh, technologies such as uh, pesticides and fertilisers to um, increase yields and uh, uh, make more food uh, make more food available. Now. It's interesting because I think we we sort of uh, got this idea of uh, sort of planting this idea of agricultural agriculture on a huge scale here, um, but statistic is that 90% of the farms in the world are actually family farms, um, not necessarily um, not necessarily small families with small plots of land, of course. Um, but uh, there's this, let's say there's the, there's the business model is not necessarily that big corporations um, own the land, but what they do do is they will own, let's say, um, or not own, um, they will they create conditions such that um, farmers are dependent on them in the sense that uh, they're dependent on fertilizer, they're dependent on seeds, um, and this is quite a pervasive model. Um, so uh, these, the, there are things obviously which need to be, uh, which would need to be addressed. Okay, it is a very large economic sector. It employs approximately, I was surprised at this, um, it employs about 50% of the global workforce, but of course we aren't talking uh, IT executives and people who are coding for Google. Um, we're talking about uh, some of the poorest people on the planet uh, who are trapped in sort of, let's say, uh, trapped in cycles of poverty, um, uh, acting as subsistence, subsistence farmers or working uh, working for um, agricultural workers, working for uh, for big landowners, um, but quite often, uh, and I think we all recognise that this the, 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 these uh, uh, this this happens, and not necessarily across the other side of the world as well, um, but. The key thing here is that um, as urbanization increases and as cities will require more and more food, 
the demand is there. Um, it's clear also that for cities to be stable, they need stable food supplies. Um, we know what happens when uh, when food supplies are cut off from cut off to to, to cities. Lots of people, no food, um, and it's it's bad news for uh, bad news for everybody. Um, and so, one of the one of the things which is talked about these days is the so-called is food security. We talk about ed energy security. You may have heard of, which is um, being in charge of the production of your own uh, the energy that you need. Um, but of of course, there's also food production. Uh, sorry, food security, which is. Um, uh, producing enough food uh, for your own uh, your own needs. Um, however, this uh, this system is developed in such a way that um, it's clear that um, because of the way the food is because of the way that the, the produce is moving around between different parts of the world um, because no one part of the world produces everything it needs. There's always a, a, an interchange and uh, there's always an exchange. Um, it's clear that um, the, uh, the, the, the question of food security is... Uh, is it, can, can can become very important. Hello, can I just ask you to switch your microphone off, please? Is that uh, Asli Han? I think you just joined. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, and so poverty is seen as one of the one of the one of the big threats to this uh, this security because uh, having un instability. At the base of the system um, uh, doesn't doesn't bode well. Okay, so um, I mentioned hmm, I mentioned um, something which is called the Green Revolution, um, and this is a term which was coined in the 60s to refer to um, the large-scale application of um, Technology to uh, traditional farm traditional farming across the across the world. Okay, it's not just uh, it's not just in uh, in sort of developed countries, but in particular, it's associated with um, uh, it's associated with certain places in South America, South Africa, and uh, in India, and. From a, let's say from a, um, a technical point of view, it's described as a as a technology transfer. Um, but basically, um, what this what this amounts to is it amounts to changing the changing the varieties of cereals or of seeds which were grown and cereals. We're talking about wheat and rice in particular. Um, we're talking about the uh, the widespread application of uh, chemical chemical fertilisers, um, agrochemicals such as pesticides (DDT). Uh, we met DDT way 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 back, um, and also a more let's say technical approach to um, water supply, irrigation. Um, also, introduction of uh, newer methods of cultivation, particularly um, involving uh, mechanisation. Now, I think it's quite curious that uh, when we think about wheat, we don't uh, we don't usually think of, of wheat as being um, dwarf, but actually it is the wheat that we use uh, for flour for industrial for, for the flour that we we uh, we we buy in the supermarket is actually a dwarf variety and um, because the natural uh, let's say the the natural form is a lot more very it's a lot more varied um, and it's a lot <coughs> it's a lot higher and it's a lot spindlier it's a lot thinner um, and 
what's the advantage of using this particular type of wheat? Well, it's because it gives a very, very high yield. Look at those lots and lots of seeds in a very small space, okay? So that's what it comes down to. Um, not a lot of waste because you're not wasting time and you're not you're not wasting fertilizer to get the, the plant to grow high. Um, you've got a you've got a um, you've got something which is a lot more efficient at producing. This is the stuff that we're after. Okay, um, and you can see this. Um, so with the, the background that more food is produced now than at any time in the past, so here we're going, this is corn production going back to um, uh, 1860 or so. This is, I think this might actually be in the US, um, but you can see that it's just, it's just, it, the trend is quite clearly uh, quite a quite a large increase, and this is from about 1945-1950 onwards. Okay, this is the time when these uh, uh, these techniques started to become uh, used, and also it's the it was also the the other aspect of this was to um, instead of using small fields to make bigger fields, incorporate bigger fields such that you could use tractors more, uh, tractors and machines more efficiently. And so this is where you lead, where we get to the, um, we get to those pictures of the, the huge uh, wheat fields in Canada which go on for miles and miles and miles. Okay, uh, but of course uh, there is a problem. Uh, and the problem is that the methods um, have the methods that have been used in this in this green revolution, uh, or that have come in with this green revolution, which has undoubtedly increased the food supply for many, 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 many people. Okay, so it, it, it's definitely uh, something which was uh, which was necessary to a point. Um, the downside is that there are, of course. Uh, problems associated with environmental degradation, so um, uh, excessive use of water, drawing on water resources, excessive use of water resources, um, and also because of the increased, let's say, mechanization, the increased uh, use of machinery, um, there is a, let's say, uh, it's become more and more um, uh, dependent upon um, uh, the non-renewable oil and gas uh, supplies for the processing and the uh, um, and the working uh, of the of the produce. Okay, so um, I'm going to have a, a quick look at some uh, modern um, aspects of food supplies, the modern food supply chain. So um, subsistence farming. Um, is relatively, let's say, uh, relatively simple. Um, most people grow stuff and they eat it, and that's it. Um, they may have a little bit of excess, which they then exchange or barter for something with someone else. Um, but the the overall, let's say, the overall system is relatively stra straightforward. The, rel the processes are relatively simple, um, and so. This is in a big. Uh, this is in big contrast to um, modern societies, which, as we saw, have an extremely complex um, food supply chain. And this is simply because most people do not actually produce any food. Most people are consumers. Uh, I think everyone around this table, while you may grow a pot of tomatoes on your balcony or in your garden in the summer, but I think most people will be. Uh, would consider themselves as consumers because um, you're not uh, you're not out there hunting or uh, scraping a living, um, trying to get things to grow. Okay, so um, we're trying to supply food to a population. Um, and this is uh, the, this is one of the t uh, a statistic, an infographic on urbanisation. So 
back in 1900, two out of every ten people, that's 20%, um, live in cities. So there's a lot of people in the rural, uh, in the rural environment, um, and so the rural environment is, 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 is still quite a rich environment in the sense that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of exchange, uh, a lot of things moving around. Um, if we move to 2010, 10 years ago or so, half of the world, half of the world's population is now living in some form of cities. Um, and this is projected to uh, to increase so that around about 2050, it's it's projected that around about 70% 70 70 of the people in the world will actually live in some form of urban area. Okay. Now, um, of course, not all urban areas are the same. So uh, if we take um, small to medium-sized towns, 100,000 people to half a million people, um, there's a lot of them, okay? Um, at the moment, uh, around about 10% of urban dwellers live in what you would class as megacities. Now, the megacities are the, those huge cities that... Uh, um, that have more than 10 million people. So in Europe, we're talking about uh, London, Paris, uh, places like that. Um, of course, if you go across the world, uh, there are quite a number of these these types of places in uh, Southeast Asia, South America, uh, Sao Paulo, uh, in Brazil, for example, um, uh, places in the US. Uh, um, You've got a uh, place like Houston and what have you. So um, th this urbanization is not necessarily everybody living in, uh, in um, high-rise buildings, but what it is saying is that they're living in an environment which is no longer, um, no longer a, a, a rural type of uh, exam, a rural type of a, uh, environment, which you would associate with, uh, let's say, um, town and village life maybe 200 years ago. Okay, so uh, looking at. Um, the let's say the statistics for um, 2020 approximately um, how things have changed in the last 50 70 years let's say so um, Africa there's been a huge increase um, from um, rural to urban as people move out of uh, relatively poor um, relatively poor uh, rural areas into the cities looking to make their their fortune um, so it's the it's the age old story encapsulated in i don't know how many fair, how many fairy tales but the idea of going to i'm going to london to 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 make my fortune as uh, dick whittington would have said um, but the thing is that uh, what's happening is that the cities are drawing, the cities are drawing, and which which means that um, the rural environments will be left with uh, fewer people, relatively speaking, um, and also the people who are probably less able to less able to move, and so it's very important that. Um, uh, there's not a let's say um, uh, that there's not a, a, a loss of uh, of ability to to produce and supply to uh, to cities based on um, knowledge and based on um, availability of uh, of manpower. So um, the general trend is for more people in bigger cities. Okay. Um, what what goes in at the beginning of the f of the supply chain? Well, um, I've sort of um, I've sort of alluded to this that uh, at the start we would be we're looking at um, the simple resources of um, land. We need space. We need water. We need some form of nutrients. Uh, we definitely need sunlight because uh, if we're growing plants, then we are. <coughs> 
we need to uh, we need to, plants need sunlight for photosynthesis. Um, plants may be fed to animals, but if you remember the thing about the primary and the secondary consumers, uh, um, the primary producers and then the uh, the primary consumers and secondary consumers. So you have you have food chains, even though it's on a farm, you still have uh, food chains. Um, and we have the biodiversity, we have the genetic diversity. These are the things which enable the productivity of the of the processes themselves. Um, now, in terms of uh, in terms of the let's say the what can grow where, um, apart from the obvious limitations of uh, of climate. So is it is it warm enough? Is there enough? Uh, is there enough water? Is there enough sun? Is there enough sunlight? Um, soil quality is extremely important. Um, are there enough minerals? Are the minerals available? And quite often the answer is no. And in the pa well in the past, oh, what people have, have developed, of, of course, is they've developed fertilisers, which enhance the um, the quantities of the nitrogen, the phosphorus and the potassium because these are the NPK. These are the three elements which are absolutely critical. Of course plants need other things as well um, but uh, these are the ones which are typically missing and it's typically it's the nitrogen and the phosphorus which are typically limiting. Um, so it's really important that there's enough of these things, enough of this stuff available. Um, and in fact, one of the key uh, industrial processes of the 20th century, which is probably, I think, uh, responsible for, um, well, it's responsible for, for feeding people, uh, and it's also responsible for killing people, unfortunately, um, is the process for getting nitrogen from the air. Because, of course, the air is 78% uh, nitrogen, um, but luckily, from a chemical, po a biochemical point of view, it's not particularly reactive. So it doesn't really, we don't really, uh, doesn't really affect us. Um, but from a, let's say, a biological perspective, um, it's a bit of a problem because it's so nitrogen is unreactive. So to get it into the uh, to actually get it into the into the soil um, it requires some uh, some chemistry and it requires some biochemistry in the in the case of. Um, uh, in the case of plants, it's typically the legumes which are associated with enriching soils with nitrogen um, because they contain, it's not the plant themselves, it's actually bacteria which have a symbiotic relationship with the plant. And these bacteria are able to use nitrogen from the atmosphere um, and convert it into um, a form which the plant can then actually use. So, for example, so historically, legumes were the beans, the bean family. They were uh, used for the um, enriching soils after uh, after the after a few cycles of um, uh, of growing crops, which were actually taking the uh, taking the nitrogen and the phosphorus. Um, yeah, so this is so this is actually uh, this is actually uh, the nitrogen uh, fixation process, the Harbour process, Harbour Bosch process from 1915, um, and that's also a clue um, uh, because nitrogen is uh, an interesting element in that, as I say, it can be used for food through fertilizers or it can be it's used it's a primary uh, component of explosives and so uh, obviously in the context of it was World War One um, having access to uh, a large industrial scale process for making 
nitrogen or fixing nitrogen from the air was extremely important um, and this was uh, this was a uh, it's thought to have been one of the contributing factors to the uh, to the length of the of the First World War. But anyway, that's that's something else. It's a fascinating piece of history. But of course, it's not just fertilisers. We also have pesticides. Um, and the pesticides uh, they come in all sorts of different uh, <coughs> different types. Um, but certainly um, DDT is perhaps the most famous. Um, DDT was widely used after the, around the Second World War and after the Second World War, um, particularly for eradicating um, uh, insect pests such as malaria, uh, such as malaria mosquitoes, or mosquitoes carrying malaria, sorry. Um, but also um, reducing the effects of um, uh, of pests that would normally attack agricultural produce uh, in order to in order to increase the uh, increase the yields, increase the amount that you could actually get. Um, so more recently. Um, you may have heard of the uh, neonicotinoids, which are another family of um, pesticide, which are supposedly more uh, selective. However, uh, they do have uh, extremely um, bad detrimental effects on honeybees. And so the problem with insecticides is that they tend to be, ex they tend to be let's say, um, fairly indiscriminatory. They just kill all insects. And of course, um, the, the problem with this thinking is that uh, you may kill the pest, but you may kill also the species that you need. So the pollinators, uh, for example. Also, the, those insects which are involved in recycling soil. So, um, these are uh, these are some of the factors. Another factor is the um, the genetic, let's say, the genetic makeup of the plants themselves. Um, and even without going to the ex extent of uh, biotechnological solutions, historically people have selected plants and animals um, by and used <coughs> and have historically done. Um, selective uh, breeding for both plants and animals to produce the sorts of crops which are um, uh, which are stable and which which reliably give good yields. So this is uh, the, these are um, typically um, critical inputs at, at the beginning of the the, 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 the supply chain. But of course. There are also effects, and um, apart from the the effects of uh, perhaps um, consuming water, which is uh, which is needed for other things, um, essentially the, uh, the 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 food production chain can have. Um, can have effects which limit its own capacity. So in a way, if you remember the thing about the feedback loops, um, this is a good example of how, uh, how something can actually act to, to limit its own, uh, its own growth. Um, so by not, uh, by, by not using water in a judicious way, um, it can deplete water resources. And so, at some point, you can no longer grow anything. Um, a more insidious uh, thing is contamination. So, um, the photo shows a uh, um, 
a fish, a dead fish on the shores of, I think it's Lake Erie or Lake um, Lake Michigan. It's Great Lakes uh, up in uh, the, between the, the US and Canada. Um, they have quite serious problems with algae every year. And in fact, this is actually, a f you notice in the, the, the name here, it's actually a forecast. Um, so they've got to the state where they know that this is going to happen. And the, these lakes are surrounded by some of the most intensively farmed uh, land on the planet. And so there's a lot of excess um, fertilizer, excess nitrogen in the um, in the water that runs into the lakes from the fields um, and this is obviously happening on a huge scale and this creates large-scale algal blooms which I think we've met before um, and of course this has a this will have a, a knock-on effect it's poisoning the fish it's it's uh, <coughs> It's devastating the um, it's devastating the the lake ecosystem, um, but it's also uh, it's also ri putting at risk people whose livelihoods rely on the lake. Though tourism, uh, fishing, uh, there's a whole a whole set of knock-on effects, um, and so one of the one of the key things with uh, with this food supply chain is this idea that um, it it, <laughs> it needs to produce efficiently, but not not at the the expense of uh, poisoning poisoning and diminishing the quality of the bio the biophysical environment that uh, that it's it's part of. Okay. Okay, so we've sort of talked about the food production sort of chain. We've got this idea of farmer going through to uh, various things, going through to the consumer. Um, in the context of uh, in the context of climate change, um, it's clear that if you're growing crops in a field and your climate changes, you're going to have problems. Okay, so we're going to have a quick we'll have a quick look at the. Um, the effects of the uh, of climate change on um, or, uh, on uh, uh, on the agricultural system. So um, it's already been shown. It's already been shown that um, the yields for crops uh, and livestock livestock production and fisheries, and particularly in uh, countries which are uh, low to middle income so we're not talking developed countries here because um, a lot of the farming in developed countries is very technological um, and so it's it's quite specialized this is the let's say these are the the middle uh, middle lower end farms which are much much more exposed to um, to the effects of changing uh, changing environment, um, it's already been shown that these yields are getting lower, um, and it's also uh, it's also fairly let's say fairly obvious that um, people who are less able to afford it will actually suffer the consequences more drastically than those who can. Um, those who can uh, afford it. So, uh, just this this graph here just shows uh, it's a sort of comparison um, uh, across different societies, different countries, um, looking at um, the proportion of uh, of money which is spent on food uh, by the poorest people in the society. So, uh, some in some countries, people. Uh, who don't have a lot spend most of what they have on uh, on on, uh, on food. So it's clear that if if um, if water sources are uh, water resources are becoming increasingly reliable, unreliable. Sorry, if um, the food supply is becoming increasingly unreliable that will put pressure on uh, that will put economic pressure on the prices of course um, so what about the yields themselves well this is a curious this is an interesting graph I think because um, 
it's forecasting and uh, this was this is back from 2007 so it's uh, it's a little bit old but at the same time it's I think it's uh, it's still relatively um, uh, gives us a guide let's say um, it's clear that if you just look at Africa and just look at the, the South America it's clear that um, changing climate is going to have quite a big effect on the places in the world where most people live so um, whereas it's forecast that in some places the productivity the agricultural productivity could actually benefit um, for some people uh, for many people there will be no benefit and if anything things could get a lot worse um, and in particular uh, I think the examples which come to mind are um, Australia um, if we think about the um, the fires uh, those really very serious fires from Australia a few just a few years ago a couple of years ago um, they've been suffering from drought now for a long 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 time many years and it's just getting worse um, when they do get rainfall it's torrential and it's uh, in, this is in some places of course uh, it's, ter it's torrential and it, it um, it's not replenishing the water that has been uh, that has been lost during the drought um, if we look at the US um, the southern states in the US are it's forecast and these are big agricultural states uh, at least in this part of the, the US um, it's forecast that these are going to suffer um, lower and lower yields okay um, Europe doesn't seem to be so badly off um, but the point is that things are changing and um, when you start to have uh, when you start to have lower yields by 10 or 15 percent it might not sound so much but you're talking we're talking um, we're talking lots of food for lots of people here so this is uh, this is let's say fairly serious stuff so how does the climate affect the um, affect this well um, of course it's going to affect the quality of the soil um, it's going to affect um, the topology, the, the shape of the land in some cases. Uh, the land will be, um, you will have erosion, you will wash the, the topsoil away and when you wash the topsoil away you take away the nutrients, you take away where the, where the, the plants can put their roots, um, <coughs> you, make, um, you make deserts. Um, this will affect the biodiversity um, when you affect the, di the biodiversity you no longer have such a, a large uh, number of insects which are pollinating and which are foraging and which are um, involved in the uh, conversion of the um, uh, of the leaf matter into a soil uh, soil humus so there's a whole set of knock-on effects here but another aspect is this uh, is this aspect of um, pests so uh, we'll, we'll see this when we talk about the um, the invasive species um, as the climate warms up you get species moving into uh, new areas um, sometimes it's a little bit more um, a little bit more subtle than that but uh, essentially uh, as as a climate as a climate modifies um, you will get um, uh, you will get the um, the local population has to adapt 
um, but you will get new things moving in and sometimes the new things which move in happen to be much better adapted to the new conditions so, and so um, you get uh, you get a whole set of um, uh, a whole set of insect and animal pests which uh, which ha can have serious uh, consequences for the um, for the production system for the the agricultural system um, as far as as far as sorry as far as greenhouse gases are concerned um, this is a rather uh, this is a rather curious um, a rather curious diagram here that um, how much uh, how much uh, greenhouse gas is produced and that's CO2 or uh, methane per gram of um, per gram of uh, of protein. So if you're talking about a chicken, you'll get you have to or you will produce um, 35 grams of uh, greenhouse gas. If you're talking about a pig. It's it's about 55, 60, all the way up to beef and buffalo. Well, buffalo, we don't usually eat buffalo, um, at least not here. Um, but at beef, that's typical, uh, it's nearly 300 grams. So one gram of protein, one gram of protein for a steak is going to cost you, is going to create 300 grams of uh, greenhouse gas, or rather, we need 300 grams of greenhouse gas to make one gram of protein in the lifetime of the animal and associated, uh, let's say, associated processing and associated processes. So, um, a lot of uh, a lot of methane emissions in cattle are associated with uh, actually with burping or with belching. Um, some of it is associated with uh, gas from the other end, um, but. Uh, it's well known that the agricultural sector, uh, and in particular livestock, has a has a particularly negative effect on um, greenhouse emissions. Okay, right. What about sustainability? So, just two seconds. Okay, so. Um, We've made the connection between um, population growth, which stimulates demand, and income growth, which stimulates preference. Um, and the, the two are sort of, they're, they're, they're quite obviously in, inexorably linked, um, inextricably linked, sorry. Um, so uh, if we think about um, if we think about the the current situation, um, so uh, sustainability will depend on um, sustainability of uh, of resources. So uh, access to water, um, access to technologies, um, and. Of course, as the climate changes, uh, water access becomes more debatable because the water, uh, the access to water may be um, may be changed quite drastically. It may be too much. It may be too little. Um, and these, of course, will have uh, consequent effects on um, on yields, but they will also have consequent effects on people's livelihoods, how people live. And if people living in the rural setting uh, feel that they're unable to make a living anymore, they will move to the cities, creating more, uh, let's say, more pressure uh, from the uh, from the urban um, fr uh, from the urban uh, point of view. So um, it's clear that uh, things are going to have to, let's say, change in some way in order to uh, move towards more sustainable agricultural practices, while at the same time maintaining um, an ability to supply enough food, because that's one of the key things that it's no point in being, uh, oh, well, 
There's no point in being uh, all sustainable if you aren't able to maintain what uh, uh, what's uh, maintain the, the, the or keep the, the population supplied with the food they need. Um, so um, people do sort of various different types of modeling. They do various p different types of projections and stuff. Um, and people tend to agree that the carrying on the way we're going, in other words, the business as usual model won't work um, because if we keep doing that, we will just exacerbate the, we will just make worse the, um, uh, the situation in terms of uh, uh, pollution, in terms of um, water usage, etc. Um, but what is clear is that in, in order to make a change of uh, direction uh, towards a more sustainable uh, situation, uh, it's clear that uh, large-scale investment is needed. Um, so I alluded to this at the beginning, um, this idea of the uh, of there is enough food in the world, it's just it's badly distributed. And the, the, the consequence of this is uh, what is described in, the, uh, in the, uh, the food system literature as the triple burden, um, which is malnutrition, obesity, and deficiencies of micro, micronutrients. Um, and, well, the micronutrients, this is typically the, uh, the, the minerals and the vitamins. Um, and historically, historically, the, um, uh, the discovery of the vitamins, for example, was based on a study of uh, diseases caused by their lack. And so um, it, was, uh, it was through uh, careful observation and, uh, let's say, investigative uh, science that um, people were able to arrive at the, uh, the, the discovery that it's not just um, it's not just the uh, it's not just the let's say the, the overall food that you need but you need small amounts of certain things that are in that food um, as far as the as far as malnutrition is concerned uh, it's clear that this is um, uh, this is this is something which is uh, obvious, obviously associated with supply, and you see that we see that every time um, there is a uh, there's a major uh, a major conflict somewhere which disrupts uh, normal supplies, um, and of course obesity is the opposite is is another form of malnutrition. It's uh, it's called it's a Obviously, it's a it's it's a, it's a, a condition which is um, which is uh, which is associated with particularly developed countries um, and developing countries in the sense that uh, as people aspire to um, a, a richer diet uh, or a more sophisticated diet. Okay, uh, whatever your view of sophistication is, um, this can lead people to make uh, make choices which are uh, maybe not um, not so uh, not so healthy compared to their the culture that they uh, they maybe come from. Um, there's a, I think there's a lot of uh, there's a, there's quite a bit of psychology in this uh, in this. Uh, in this thing, in this aspect, I think about um, uh, particularly if you're sort of you feel like you're going towards a, a better um, a better situation, but of course, all that glitters is not necessarily gold. So um, the food uh, the food production system is uh, because of the environmental constraints um, is going to have to and because it has to meet these challenges of the of the distribution um, 
is going to have to work out how to maintain the yields with less input. Okay, so uh, there's another example here, which is um, which is the 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 idea of growing uh, growing food crops and using them to make fuel. Um, now. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of work being done on uh, so-called bio biogas biofuel biofuel production in um, uh, in the U.S. in particular, but across the world in general. Um, historically, uh, Brazil had a, an answer to this a long time ago because um, for a number of year for quite a number of years in the 60s and the 70s. Is. They were, <clears throat> they had an excess of sugar crop, excess of sugar beet, and rather than uh, rather than let it go to waste, they fermented it and used it to uh, to make alcohol for, for f as fuel. Um, adapting cars and engines and what have you. So this was quite a this was quite a let's say quite a, a an interesting um, local uh, solution to a, to a to an otherwise um, difficult economic problem, which is what do you do with an excess of sugar be sugar beet? Because if you put it on the market, you collapse the price, and you, you so you're you're um, uh, you're hitting yourself on the foot. You're, <laughs> you're dropping it on. Uh, you're hitting yourself on your on your foot if you do that. But at the same time, you need to keep the prices at a certain level for the farmers. And so, um, what you do, you buy it, you you convert it, and you can sell this stuff as fuel. Um, but what's happened more recently is that um, people are using corn. And corn is, of course, a maize. Okay, uh, corn is a is a staple in a staple crop in some countries, and um, with supplements, government supplements in the U.S. for um, for biofuel production. So, in other words, growing corn, but using it for making biofuel rather than for making tortillas. Um, the there was a there was a knock on effect that people would grow corn and last year they sold it for food this year they sell it they would sell it for making biofuel and so that would mean there was less f corn available for food so this is an important point that when people talk about biofuel um it sounds it sounds nice it sounds oh yeah okay we're going green well First of all, it's based on carbon, so you're burning it anyway, and you you want carbon-free fuels. Okay, it's still based on combustion. Um, true, it's a plant, and so it would be uh, it would be essentially neutral if you capture the carbon that it produces in in its waste gas. Um, but um, it's this it's this bio thing that. Uh, um, it's not the it's not it's not the best solution if you look at the whole system. It's better that that food, that corn, is used for for feeding people <laughs> rather than uh, feeding cars. Okay, sorry, I'm getting a little bit polemical, but um, the, the it, there are plenty of examples of uh, let's say crops which can be uh, which can be used in different ways. Um, so. The only, I think, the only thing that you could really that we could really say is that we have, over time, got used to the idea of relatively cheap food. And okay, oops, here we go. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I was. I just scrolled down the chat there. Yeah. Um, it is difficult to find. Uh, it's this idea of balance, but I think we have to, at some point, we have to r sort of realise that um, uh, we can't necessarily have everything, and so some things will have to be 
will have to be sacrificed. Personally, I would sacrifice avocados because I don't like them. But um, joke, joking apart, joking apart, um, it's clear that uh, any any of these, let's say, um, actions to um, change the food system, change the food si food production system to make it more sustainable, to make it um, more sustainable in terms of uh, the, the resource degradation, in terms of the greenhouse gases, this will almost inevitably lead to uh, an increase in the cost of food. Um, but again, we can we can, we can uh, think that approximately the statistic is this: that approximately a third of the food which is produced is wasted. Okay, now I'm sort of anticipating something that's a little bit later on, um, but if we think if we bear that in mind, um, we can imagine that there are places where we can uh, certainly gain efficiencies okay okay so I'm going to switch a little bit to um, thinking about what people actually grow um, whereas once upon a time it literally was a matter of survival um, and being able to grow enough stuff to get get you through the winter to next year hope hoping that um, next year will provide uh, sun and water so that you can grow your plants um, we've gone well well beyond that uh, so of course what grows where will depend on this intersection between the genetic endowment of the um, of the of the plants and the animals themselves uh, that's the biological endowment of the of the ecosystem, if you like, um, and the biophysical environment itself. Okay, so just a couple of examples, or a couple of, or an, an example in particular, which I was rather curious about. Uh, um, maize. This is corn, of course. Um, and this illustrates the uh, this illustrates the um, how the genetics of the species needs will be changed or needs to be changed in order to adapt it to something which is let's say more productive. So looking at the looking at this. Um, this progression now um, this one you can't really see here because it's a bit small that's what it looks like okay so this is a plant which is called Teosinte um, and this is what corn started like <laughs> about 7,000 years ago this is obviously corn the cob now okay this is inst instantly recognizable um, but uh, this started like that Okay. Now, how did it get there? This is rather curious, I think, because um, it was domesticated at some point. People started to uh, started to do crossbreeding and uh, all sorts of stuff to uh, produce to get it to produce more seeds um, and to adapt it to particular uh, to particular uh, places in South America. Um, but it was when it came to Europe when it was brought to Europe because it didn't come on its own, it, it was brought to Europe, that um, it was actually French farmers who started to do selective breeding. And uh, in the intervening period between, nine, between 1494 and 1940 or so, um, there were a large numbers of uh, there were large numbers of uh, different types of corn produced. Um, and it's curious because these different types are, are actually making a bit of a comeback, um, although they're still a long, long way away from the uh, the original Teosinte uh, right at the beginning. Um, from 1947 onwards, what's happened is that um, these uh, 
these populations, these different types of corn, which you occasionally see uh, every so often in the farmers' markets these days, um, were some were selected and hybrids were created to get to the the standard. Because this, if you think about it, this is the image of of, of, of corn on the cob. Um, and it's a sort of a standard type of thing which has a particular size, particular shape, particular weight um, and so uh, this, is the, this is the result of, uh, of se selective breeding in order to make a crop which will grow in places which are beyond the normal, um, its normal range so I think uh, I think corn is is actually quite a nice example of how something which is rather let's say rather scrawny there's not there's not a lot of not a lot of nutrient in there uh, to something which is uh, has got a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of nutrients and a lot of um, material let's say okay so. Um, in general, uh, concentrating on um, on wheat and rice and uh, grains like corn um, during the Green Revolution was a good strategy because about approximately just under 50% of the diet of the world across the world is made of is made up of grains of some kind cereals of some kind um, and natural natural wheat um, is has been described as being hyper variable it grows all over the place in all sorts of different forms and um, it's able to it's adapted it's able to adapt itself to many 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 different types of uh, climate situations um, this is in complete contrast to the cultivated wheat which has been selected for uh, for actually for characteristics which make it easier to grow and easy to process so um, again, this is maybe something that you might never have thought of that you could you can grow a plant which has the characteristics that the seeds fall off more easily if you hit them okay and this is the process of threshing um, and one of the or well not one of several of the of the characteristics of modern wheat uh, earlier I talked about it being a dwarf variety um, it's dwarf it's it, it, it still grows quite high but it's it's not as high as the natural as the the normal let's say the natural ancestor um, why does it have this ad why why grow the dwarf variety well it's able to withstand um, more variable climate, stronger winds, uh, more rain, and so uh, the, these, let's say, these physical characteristics of the thing are part of the uh, part of the uh, part of the increasing the yield of uh, increasing the efficiency of the of the of the plant. Okay. The only thing is, though, that it does need more. Whereas wild corn or wild wheat will grow in lots and lots of different places, um, the cultivated wheat needs more for, uh, it needs more fertile ground, so it's more um, it needs more in inputs in terms of nutrients. Okay, um, this is something that we do know. I'm not really going to say too much about it because it's something which I think people are well aware of. Um, intensive farming. Uh, now, we we don't use that term applied to um, applied to corn and wheat and what have you things in fields, but we do use it in terms of um, applied to animals. And um, 
animal husbandry is a little bit different to the uh, to the um, to growing growing crops in fields um, for several reasons. Um, but from an industry point of view, um, there are uh, these. There there is a big there is a big push towards let's say the industrialization of uh, animal production and of course this has led to some rather um, let's say dubious uh, practices in terms of um, keeping the animals and overuse of antibiotics and uh, dealing with the waste of uh, because it's one thing if you have chickens running around in a courtyard um, it's another thing if you've got tens of thousands of chickens in a relatively small area uh, making tens of thousands of uh, chicken um, droppings every day, so it, these are these are things which uh, which obviously have big uh, impacts, environmental impacts. Uh, pig farming, for example, intensive pig farming, is also notorious for its um, its environmental foot, footprint, um, but. In particular, these food producers tend to be very closely associated with the industrial processes, and there is uh, what you find is that there are relatively few um, important actors within the production system. These are the big companies. Um, uh, these are the big companies which uh, the typically global companies which dominate the food industry and these are uh, or dominate the food production in industry uh, the processing and the selling and these are the the companies which tend to influence um, tend to have a lot of influence when people People are talking of um, uh, in trade neg trade negotiations. Okay, so uh, this is the example of the uh, of the tortillas. I did fi I did find the <laughs> I did find the um, uh, the reference here. It's, uh, this was from the Al Jazeera website, but um, essentially um, this is tortilla corn is a staple in Mexico, um, and so having um, having corn prices double or triple um, can have big effects for uh, certain uh, certain groups of people. Okay, um, so this is just a general comment about biofuels and biomaterials. I'm not saying that they're evil in and of themselves. It's just that we have to look at them critically um, in terms of the the effect that they can uh, they can have. And sometimes this can be local in the sense that uh, what makes sense, for example, in Brazil with um, fuel from sugar, doesn't make any sense in Europe necessarily. Okay. Okay. Um, what about the near future? Well, the okay. So the the global food supply chain, as it's currently set up, um, is starting to let's say uh, reach it. Well, it is re it's reached its limits. The and the, the these are the limits, the so-called hard limits, the hard systemic limits imposed by the um, the environment, uh, the biophysical environment, uh, which is uh, uh, those factors, the water supply, nutrients, etc. Um, but there's also another point which is inherent in the food itself, and that is that um, it's the, the idea of the genetic potential. In other words, how far can you take these things without further modifying them? Uh, how far can you push the wheat um, or the corn and essentially it's thought that most of the major crops have reached the maximum approximately the maximum that you are going to get in terms of yields so um, we've got a we've got a let's say potential problem here um, which is that uh, even if you wanted to you couldn't continue uh, in the way that you've done things in the past and these are the so-called hard boundaries of the system so um, 
the FAO has projected that there are enough land, water and mineral resources to support a large increase in food supply by 2050, but they haven't put in to the calculation that um, the biosphere is reaching its limits. Um, the capacity, now this is a curious one because um, the nitrogen cycle which is, um, if you remember the, the carbon cycle, which is go, which goes from carbon in the carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere through the plants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there are cycles also for nitrogen and phosphorus and other elements, so there are minerals as well. Um, but the nitrogen cycle has been completely, let's say, um, uh, changed by the fact that. Uh, the a lot of the nitrogen uh, available is actually has been taken from the atmosphere industrially. Okay, but even that um, we can we can take as much nitrogen as we want from the atmosphere. We can make as much ammonia as we want, but there's no point because the we would end up just poisoning everything. <laughs> Okay, because the, the, the biosphere only has a certain capacity to process the nitrogen, um, whether that's through, uh, through the bacteria or uh, the algae or whatever. And of course, this has, uh, this has um, knock-on effects in terms of the, uh, the integrity of the biosphere itself. So essentially, we are, br we are reaching, uh, we're reaching limits, and then we've got the limits imposed by the climate. So it's true. You saw the map that you may be able to grow wheat in the high Arctic in Canada. Fantastic. Um, but whether that's coming at the cost of being able to, not being able to walk uh, walk out of your house in Australia because the outside temperature is 50 degrees. Uh, this is maybe you know this is something which um, uh, don't when people say ah oh, yeah but you know global warming you know that that's fine. Um, th this is something which is clearly not uh, clearly not the case. Um, okay, so all of these. All of these things are, let's say, coming to a coming to a head here, um, and amongst these things are is the uh, the point about biodiversity, which is that um, since so in terms of agriculture, um, I think I think perhaps the example that's maybe most, let's say, most familiar would be apples. Thinking about apples, um, once upon a time, when I was a kid, when dinosaurs ruled the earth and pterodactyls flew and crocodiles swam in the river, um, there were loads of different types of apples. I didn't like any of them, but there were lots of different types. And then, all of a sudden, ah, maybe... 1975, 1980, all of a sudden there were fewer and fewer different types of apples available. Now, it seemed, things seem to have got a little bit better over the last few years that people are starting to, f you go to the supermarket and you can find different types of apples again, but definitely not the, uh, not the ones which uh, we used to have. And this is an example of the genetic diversity which has been lost simply because it's much easier to produce certain types of apples, store certain types of apples, collect certain types of apples, than it is others. And so since about 1900, um, a lot of genetic diversity has been lost simply because um, farmers all across the world have, uh, have abandoned um, lower yielding um, varieties, uh, local varieties, which may be very particular, which may have very particular uh, types of uh, flavors and what have you, to things which are um, uh, which things are, which things which are more regular and more reliable. Um, a similar thing has happened with uh, livestock. 
uh, in the sense that um, every so often you hear about uh, a farm where farmers are um, let's say uh, resuscitating an ancient breed from maybe the Middle Ages or what have you um, and this is again why why do we why why do we find this well it's because uh because in a in a world where um the market is very very competitive you have a certain amount of time to produce a certain amount of stuff this year okay or in a particular you know in a particular time slot and so you want to make sure that you get the best, you get the most and the best uh, yield that you can. And so, of course, um, it's sort of like a self-fulfilling self prophecy. Um, the message from the consumer, from the market, is that people want, want to see different varieties of apples now. They're sick of just uh, just the uh, the golden delicious or whatever they are, uh, and so we're starting to see the russets and the the, the fujis and the, the various uh, various different types starting to appear again. Um, but notice that's the consumer. That's the consumer feeding back the information that. Uh, there's more um, actually consumers don't necessarily want perfect apple looking apples they want tasty apples okay and I'm sure that everyone here will have uh, been in that situation uh, at, in some uh, uh, some regards but notice look at this statistic here that 75% of the world's food is generated from only 12 plants and five animal species. Okay, now that's species. So, okay, within within those species, we've got uh, you've got the cows, you've got the pigs, you've got the the chickens, and within the cows, you've got who knows how many different breeds of cow for different uh, breeds of cattle for different uh, uh, different purposes. But it's telling that um, even though there is actually a lot of uh, a lot of stuff available um, a lot of uh, yeah there is a seed bank that tries to preserve species that are no longer cultivated that that's that's absolutely true um, I think part of it is to actually um, uh, encourage people to uh, to encourage farmers through the market to to grow stuff that uh, is less uh, is less let's say let's say less perfect or less uh, less industrial. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'll tell you what. Okay. Yeah. So there we go. So. Um, Biodiversity and crops. Um, so uh, we've got a lot of a lot of areas which we which are considered to be economically un unproductive are actually. Uh, do you remember we talked about ecological services, which was a rather weird concept? Okay, these are providing eco ecological services. Um, so the, the 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 meadow, the fallow meadow, or the uh, the hedgerow, or the wetland, which doesn't appear to be of use to man or beast, these are providing ecological services by uh, acting as places where um, pollinating insects can breed um, and uh, uh, birds, birds which uh, also um, uh, remove pests. Uh, you know, th these are places which can be extremely important, and so uh, it's very important to um, uh, to remember to bring this uh, to bring this thinking back to the idea of balance. Let's say so. We need uh, we do need. Um, we do need to be able to produce enough food for everybody, but not at the expense of poisoning 
the environment and destroying the um, destroying the habitats which support the animals which can help which can actually help the uh, help the process of uh, of growing food okay i'm going to i've just looked at the time and it's it's half past six i'm just going to, going to make a note of where i am um, and i'm going to um, I'm going to stop there because I think it's it's a good place to it's a good place to pause. Um, we're sort of thinking about uh, thinking about this idea of biodiversity. We're thinking about this idea of um, limits to the um, uh, limits to the food supply system. Um, I mean, I realise that maybe some of this sounds a little bit, uh, little, little bit depressing in its own way. It's not intended to be. It's intended as a, as a, a maybe to uh, open your eyes to some things that maybe you hadn't really thought about before, and particularly the complexity that is behind uh, that lettuce that you buy in the supermarket or that um, uh, that product that you buy in the shop okay unless you actually know the local farmer who grew it um, it could be and if you're an, if you're a, if you if you are an aficionado of avocados that's quite a, a mouthful um, they will almost certainly have not come from relatively uh, close so <laughs> So hopefully, uh, hopefully this will give you something to think about. Okay. So um, I don't know whether anyone has a, a last minute, last minute question. So thank you very much for your <coughs> for your attention. Thank you very much for your patience as ever. Um, we have two more sessions, and uh, um, I wish everyone a pleasant uh, a pleasant evening. So thank you very much. Depressive but very interesting. Sorry, Paul. Uh, mi spiace, Paola. <laughs> no, ma non è no, non è deprimente. No, it's not. It's not that. No, it just is. It's just a description. That's all. It's just a description. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Okay, now, uh, da, 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 da. I don't know.